So why black and white? To understand black and white, we first must examine the history of black and white. We need to undertake a comparative and historical analysis with an emphasis on the relative intrinsic value of the inherent intermodal causeways of the medium when compared to other artistic disciplines. Now, everyone understood that, right? Nobody understood that. I don't even understand that. Unfortunately for you, this is an incredibly long and boring part of the presentation. So let's get started. In the beginning, all art was created in black and white, but then color was invented and the world turned colorful. But then photography was invented and it turned back to black and white. But then coat of color was invented and it turned back to color. The end. That's about all we need to know about the history of black and white. Now, let me ask you, how many of you would buy a three-legged dog or get on an airplane with only one wing or buy a car with no wheels? So why then would you take a perfectly good color image and strip it of all color? Why? It would be like driving a Model T in a Tesla world, or using wet plates in a digital world. It would be like owning a three-legged dog, just somehow incomplete. I'd like to tell you about my journey to black and white, why I love it, and why you might consider it. My story begins at the age of 14 when I was living in Rochester, New York. I was out for a hike one day with a friend, and we came across this old ruin of a house, and he told me it had once been owned by George Eastman, the father of Kodak. And that piqued my interest. I went to the school library, checked out his biography and began reading. And before I had finished that book, I fell in love with photography. And I just had this feeling it was my destiny to be a photographer. Now that's before I had ever taken my first picture, before I'd ever worked in a dark room and saw that print come up in the developer. And for the next 10 years, my entire life was photography. If I wasn't shooting, I was working in the dark room or looking at the works of the great masters. And as I looked at their work, I was always drawn to a very particular style of image. They were dark images. They were contrasty images. They were images that would cause the shudder to go down my spine when I saw an image that I loved. And they inspired me and they made me want to create these same types of images. This is what I call my very first fine art image created at age 14. Now, a lot of people ask me, but why black and white, Cole? You were born into a color world. And I tell them, no, I was born into a black and white world. When I was a boy, television was all in black and white. Movies were in black and white. The news was delivered in black and white. My childhood heroes were in black and white. And sadly, our nation was still segregated into black and white. And so I created black and white images. And perhaps those images are a reflection of the world that I grew up in. Now for me, color records the surface of the image, but black and white records those feelings that lie beneath the surface. Or in other words, Color is a happy meal and black and white is fine dining. Now, what do I look for in a great black and white image? Well, I love a dark image. I love a glowing subject. I love detail, especially when the detail is enhanced by contrast. I love simple shapes, textures and patterns. And increasingly, my work is getting more and more simple, often through the use of a long exposure. And I'll use long exposures with water, with sky, and even with people. This is called the Angel Gabriel. And it's what I call my most significant image because it was the very first time that I had used my vision to create an image as I stood there I could see the final version of the image in my head. 
I was photographing on the Newport Beach Pier in Southern California. And it, it was a crowded day. Hundreds of people are walking past. But because it's a long exposure, they all disappeared, except for those few ghosts who lingered for just a second. And the image was interesting, but it was lacking. It was lacking a subject. And so I looked around for someone I could ask to stand in my photograph, and I saw this homeless man. And he was eating French fries out of a trash can. And I approached him and I asked him if he would stand in for my image, I'd be happy to take him to lunch. And you remember, he was so reluctant. He was so suspicious of me and my motives, but he finally agreed. And he wanted to hold his Bible. And this is the image that we used. And it turned out that his name was Gabriel. And so I called the image, the angel Gabriel. Afterwards, Gabriel and I went to a very nice restaurant. And imagine me walking in with a homeless person who is barefoot, filthy with matted hair. And as we sat down and looked at the menu, I said, Gabriel, order anything that you like. And he said, I'd love a steak with mushrooms and onions. I haven't had one in years. And when the waitress brought it, he picked it up with his hands and ate it. He was a delightful fellow. He had been a drug addict, but was now clean. I also found out that Gabriel was from Romania, and I'm half Romanian, so we had that in common and talked about the old country and why he came here. As we were getting ready to part ways, I learned that his father lived nearby. I said, Gabriel, give me your dad's name and address, and if I sell any of these images, I'd be happy to share a portion with you, to which he responded, give it to someone who can really use it. I have everything that I need. And Gabriel walked away with his only two possessions, his Bible and a bedroll. I go back to Southern California several times a year and always go back to the pier looking for Gabriel, but have never seen him again. So how do you learn to photograph in black and white? Well, here's what I do. First, put your camera into monochrome mode and raw mode. Now, the and is the important word. In monochrome mode, it lets you see the image in black and white on the back of the camera. That's the best way to visualize it. But because you're shooting in raw mode, it saves the image in color. Now, why would a black and white photographer want to record the image in color? It's because I don't want the camera to make those black and white decisions for me. Let me illustrate why. The image in the upper left is a black and white that the camera recorded in black and white. And in the lower right is the color image that I converted to black and white. A lot of the creative process is in that color conversion. And never photograph in monochrome and JPEG mode because what you'll end up with is a black and white image and you can't then convert it to black and white yourself. Learn how colors translate into shades of gray because my work's all about the contrast. And even more importantly, Learn how you can manipulate those colors into different shades of gray with the black and white conversion program in Photoshop, and I'll demonstrate that. Then think in terms of shapes, contrast, and composition. I like to think of a black and white image as a naked image. It's bare, no color to hide behind. And if you don't have a great composition, it's readily apparent. Now, what subjects look great in black and white? Well, I actually think they all do, except for one, unicorns. Those should always be photographed in color. Now tonight, I'd like to give you a sampling of some of my work. I'd like to show you images from each of my different portfolios interspersed with my photographic philosophies. Now, what's a portfolio? A portfolio is simply a group of images that are related or tell a story. And for years, I resisted working in portfolios. I called myself a photographic grazer. I just loved to go wherever the grass was greener. And I created some good images, but they weren't related. They didn't tell a story. Well, a few years later, I decided to submit my work to Lensworth, a black and white publication. And the submission guidelines are pretty simple submit 15 to 25 images on a single subject. Then he said, do not send us your greatest hits. Well, I thought to myself, well, he's never seen my greatest hits. And so off they went. 
Well, they came back within just a couple of days with this big hand scrawled note that said, pick one image and send me 15 on that subject. And that was the kick I needed to begin my very first portfolio, grain silos. Where we live, both of us, really all of us, we're on the edge of the Great Plains. And as you go out onto the plains, these grain silos are everywhere. They're at the center of every family farm and at the heart of every small town. And for nine months, I traveled the plains trying to portray these silos, not as objects of utility, but rather as objects of art. And this was the very first portfolio that I got into lens work. And the big lesson I took from my first portfolio, I love working on projects. And now when I don't have something to work on, I'm at a loss looking for that next project to work on. Now I've heard you don't consider yourself a photographer. No, I don't. I think of myself as an artist who uses photography. But for 35 years, I did think I was a photographer and I had a photographer's mentality. As a photographer, I almost worshiped my equipment. But now as an artist, my God is the image. and My camera is simply a tool. As a photographer, my goal was to document what my eye saw. But now as an artist, my goal is to show you what I'm seeing inside my head through my vision. And there's nothing wrong with being a photographer or documenting. But I wanted to create images. Melting giants. A few years ago, I heard two men talking about these incredible icebergs that would come along the coast of Newfoundland. And so off I went, driving in my car for a month and putting 9,000 miles on the car. And when I got there, I saw this story as a very sad story. These icebergs live a very short life. They begin by breaking off a glacier in Greenland. Then they spend nine to 12 months going counterclockwise until they come along the coast of Newfoundland. There they break into smaller pieces and run aground. And then rocking in the surf, they break up and end up melting, dying on the shore as 30,000 year old ice cubes. So instead of creating a portfolio like most others have in a color with bright blues, I created this as a very dark black and white with high contrast. Unlike the conditions I was working under, it was beautiful days. And to give you a sense of scale, that one iceberg on the horizon on the right, that was probably four or five times the size of an aircraft carrier, just massive. And then they just would break apart, run aground and break into those small pieces. Ansel Adams. When I was a boy, Ansel Adams was our hero. He was the man who brought black and white photography to the masses. I so loved his work and his look that I would try to imitate it. I would even go to Yosemite and try to find where he stood for his iconic shots and try to recreate them. The greatest compliment anyone could give me is if they looked at one of my images and said, that reminds me of an Ansel Adams. And I beam with pride. Well, a few years later, I decided to go to review Santa Fe. That's where you go and show your work to experts in the field, hoping to be discovered. And I remember getting to the very last reviewer of a very long day, and I showed him my work. He looked at it very briefly and then brusquely pushed it back to me and said, it looks like you're trying to copy Ansel Adams. And I responded, I am, I love Ansel Adams. And he then said something that would change not just my photography, but my entire life. He said, Ansel already did Ansel. What can you do that exhibits your unique vision? Pow. What an epiphany. It suddenly occurred to me, was it my life's ambition to become known as the world's greatest Ansel Adams imitator? Can you imagine tonight if Dave introduced me that way? Tonight, our guest speaker is Cole Thompson. He is the foremost imitator of Ansel Adams photographs. Or did I have something to say of my own? And that set me forth on a two-year journey to find out 
if I had a vision. Monoliths. Every September, I go to a small town on the Oregon coast called Bandon, Oregon. It's got this incredible two mile stretch of beach where these monoliths stick straight up out of the sand. And I just fell in love with it the first time I went. And I've been going now for 17 years. And every year the weather is a little different. The light is a little different. But most importantly, every year my vision is a little different. And I come home with something that I love. So vision, what is it? I'd heard people use the word. I understood the context in which they use the word, but I didn't really understand what it was. Is it a style that you develop? Is it a look or a technique? Is it a creative talent that you're born with? Is it something that some people have and others do not? And it turns out that it's none of those things. Vision is simply the sum total of our life experiences that allows us to see the world in a unique way. Imagine if you took everything that you've been taught, experienced, and believe in, and put that all into a blender, and take that mix and cast lenses that you then see the world through. And what you see through those life lenses is your vision. It's simply how you see. Vision's not learned or developed. You can't take a course on vision, come out with this certificate in your vision, but rather vision has to be discovered. And I use the word discovered purposely because the most important truth I learned about vision is that we all have one. Every one of us, you can't not have a vision. Why is vision so important? because it's the difference between an average image and a great image. It's what puts your mark on it. It's what gives your image a spark of life. Trees from a train. In the 1970s, I lived in Alaska, but sadly never returned, never went back for a vacation, never took my family there, never went back to visit old friends. And I always regretted that. Well, in October of 2019, just before COVID hit, a friend called me up and said, I got one of these two for one ticket deals and I'm headed to Alaska. Would you like to join me? And I jumped at the chance. I didn't know what I wanted to do there necessarily, but I did want to take the train from Fairbanks to Anchorage. It's this incredible 12 hour train ride through the most rugged and isolated parts of Alaska. And we were so fortunate to have a snowstorm that day. Well, when you ride a train, the first thing you do is grab a window seat, get your camera out and start looking for something. And I could quickly see this was gonna be way harder than I ever imagined. All you really could see were trees whizzing by at 50 miles per hour. And because of the snow, there were no great vistas to be seen. So I went between two cars, opened up both doors and through the snow began shooting the most obvious subject, the trees. Then I thought, well, I'm gonna pan my camera with the trees. Then I thought, what would happen if I used a long exposure and panned with the trees? And I started getting this incredible effect, the swirl that I didn't understand, but I loved it. And so for the next 12 hours, I just played with this technique, trying to learn to control it. I didn't understand it, but I did learn to control it a little bit. And it wasn't until I got home that I fully understood what was happening. It was because of all the motion, the trees going one way, the train going another, me panning with the slow shutter speed. But the real key was the shutter. A focal plane shutter in our digital SLRs is a small slit that moves from top to bottom. That combined with all of these other motions created this swirl as I called it. Sometimes the swirl was 360 degrees, but the object in the center was still. And this was on a recent cover of Lens Work. So how did I find my vision? I didn't even understand what vision was, so how could I find it? Well, I did the most obvious thing. I Googled it, how to find your vision. 
And all I could find was articles about my eyesight. So I just came up with 10 ideas, 10 steps that I just instinctively felt if I followed through with, I would find out if I had a vision. Remember at that time, I didn't know if, if I had one. First thing that I did is I printed out my favorite images. And I think printing them out was helpful. And I put them into two piles, images that I really, really loved and everything else. Now that might sound like a really simple assignment. Who doesn't know what they love and what they don't love? But for me, it wasn't simple. And here's why. I found that I was, my opinion of my work was swayed by what other people thought of my work. If I produced an image that earned a lot of likes or a lot of wins or was published or sold well, I found myself liking that image more and more. So I had to learn to separate what I loved from what others loved. Next, I looked at the small pile. I looked at each image and I said, what do I love about this image? I didn't say, what do they have in common? Because they were all over the place. But what was it about that image that attracted me to it? Next, I committed to never again producing work that I didn't love. If I was at Bandon Beach and I saw the world's greatest sunset, and I'm not a sunset person, but I knew it would sell or it would earn likes or win contests, I would walk away from it. It's what I call creating honest work, staying true to what I love and not trying to please other people. Next, I practiced a very controversial practice, photographic celibacy. I don't look at the work of other photographers. Now, why not? Well, first, I found myself often imitating their look or even stealing their ideas. And secondly, I reasoned that if I was going to find my vision, I needed to stop immersing myself in other people's vision. Next, I had to change my mindset from photographer to artist. I carried a lot of baggage as a photographer, things like I should never manipulate an image. If I wanted to be creative and become an artist, I had to manipulate the image to transform it into what I was seeing inside my head. And the hardest one of all, I had to stop caring what other th people thought of my work. If I was gonna create just for myself, that had to be enough. And it took me two very long, very hard years to find my vision. And I was looking for something so complicated and I would become so discouraged because I didn't think I was making any progress. But then it turns out that vision was really just so very simple. It's simply how I see things and how I want them to be. Now, to give you a visual depiction of vision and what it looks like, I'd like to show you some before and after images. The before image is going to show you what the eye saw, and the after images, what I was seeing inside my head through that vision. Let's start with the angel Gabriel, because that was the very first time it had ever happened to me. As I stood there that day, I could see the final image in my head and what it would look like. And that was so important because it became a roadmap for not just the shot, but especially for the post-processing. And I was new to Photoshop. And as you can see, I had to do a lot of work and learn a lot of techniques to bring that image into compliance with my vision. This is called Skeleton. And it's a pile of bones that I found laying along the river in my hometown, exactly as they lay. And as I stood looking down on those bones, I remember thinking, the image will be this very dark, pile of leaves with these bright bones shining out. But that's not what my eyes saw. I saw bright leaves and bright bones. So again, I had to learn some techniques to bring that image into compliance with my vision. This is windmill and moonlight taken above Grand Island, Nebraska on a very, very cold night. It had just snowed. The sky had cleared and now I had almost a full moon and the lighting conditions were terrible because I couldn't get a single exposure that worked for both the sky and the foreground. So I just did what made sense to me. I, I took one exposure for the sky, I took one exposure for the foreground, and I cut and pasted the two together in Photoshop. Now, some people will say, after seeing your before and after images, I realize that I need to learn a lot more about Photoshop. And that is exactly not my point. 
Some people think you've got to have the skills before you can express your vision. And they go on an endless pursuit to learn all the skills in the world. And they never find the time to attend to their vision. I disagree with that approach. I say, find your vision first, then go get the skills you need to express it. When I created the series, The Ghost of Auschwitz-Birkenau, I had no idea how to create ghosts. My only experience with ghosts was Gabriel when I saw those few ghosts who had lingered. But I had an idea in my head. I knew what the images should look like. And so I had all the time in the world to make it so. But as you look at that before image, man, I really had to work to transform that into that final image. But it's okay, I had the roadmap in my head. It was burned in my memory. This is my favorite glacier from our iceberg from the Melton, Melting Giant series. And he almost didn't make it into the series. And here's why. He was rocking so badly in the surf that I couldn't do a long exposure like all of the other images. And so I just simply took a still image and I said, I'll find a way to transform that into a long exposure later. And I did, I found a way. And it looks exactly like all the other images and who had 30 second exposures. I can always learn a technique, I can always find a way, but having that vision to drive me is the key. Here's a recent shot, it's a, uh, from one of my series called Power Lines, taken in Idaho. And as I stood there, it occurred to me that many people would see this image, their vision would be in color. But my vision was in black and white with very dark tones and very high contrasts. And whatever your vision is, you have to follow it. Mine just happens to be in black and white. Now, my post-processing is incredibly simple. You won't find a simpler processing technique than mine. I typically am only using six tools in Photoshop. Here's the six steps that I follow. And what I'd like to do now is just kind of show you how I process one of my images. The first step is I bring the color image into Photoshop. And you rem all remember why it's in color? Because I shot in raw. No matter what you do to your settings, if you shoot in raw, you get a plain vanilla color image. And all I do is I play with those sliders there. I really don't know what I'm doing. I just play with them until the image looks as close to my vision as is possible. Step two is where the magic starts to happen, the black and white conversion. They give you these color sliders that allow you to drastically change the look of the image. And you just play with them. Now let me show you what you can do with them. Here's that uh, power line image. All four of these images are the same image. And all I've done is change two of the color sliders. Look in the bottom right how black the sky is. Now look to the left how white the sky is. Just by changing these sliders, it's like adding a color filter but after the fact. Step three, I adjust my levels. Now, what does that mean? It simply means that I want a true black and a true white in my image. And a lot of people will look at the monitor and say, well, that looks like it's got a good black and a good white. I'm good to go. But you can't tell by looking at the monitor. You gotta look at that histogram. And this histogram reveals that I don't have a good black and I don't have a true white. So all you do is take those little triangles, you pull them over, and instantly the image does have a good black and a good white. The next step, oh, just a reminder, never trust the monitor, always look at the histogram. Dodge and burn, this is the fourth step. And if you worked in a dark room, you know what this means. It simply means that I can control little parts of the image without affecting the rest of the image. And I do that with a pen and a tablet. It allows me to almost draw on the image. And so for this image, I darkened the sky and vignetted it. I added detail in that frothy highlight area and I burnt down some distracting detail in the foreground. The fifth step, I add contrast. Now I admit I love contrast, but I didn't add it just because I love it. I added it for a practical reason. When, when you look at an image on a monitor, it always looks wonderful. It's got a lot of pop to it. But often when you print it out, it looks a little flat. And that's just the nature of printing on paper. And so by adding extra contrast, 
I'm able to get that image that's printed to look almost as good as the monitor. And the last step, I simply spot my image because I always have a dirty sensor. And there's the before and after. Now, popular photography called me the Photoshop heretic because they said I did everything wrong. And you know what? I used to be so embarrassed at my photo processing techniques. I'd never let anybody else watch me. I thought they were so simple. And when I heard my friends talk, they seemed so complicated. They talked about layers and masks and plugins and all these things that I don't even know how to do. But then I realized that it doesn't matter how you get there. All that matters is the final image. And in truth, there is no wrong way to use Photoshop. I just prefer a very, very simple way. Now, I'd like to share the secret to post-processing, more important than those six steps. It is knowing what you want to do, not knowing how to do it. Anyone can learn how to do it. The techniques are never the key to a great image. As I stand before a scene, I always see the final image in my head, and that is my roadmap. Isolated. Isolated is a very simple project about isolation expressed through trees. And this is an open project. I've got a number of these open projects, meaning they're just not finished yet. And I like having these open projects because no matter where I go in the world, I can always stumble upon a great image to add to the portfolio. When I was in Newfoundland and I was photographing the icebergs, I heard about the Bay of Fundy and I wanted to go there. It is famous because it has the highest tides in the world, over 55 feet. And so I went there hoping to be there at high tide, but when I got there, it was low tide. So I had to wait around for many hours. And I just positioned myself down at the bottom stairs going up to the bay. And by the time the tide finally came up, it was very dark and the tripod was partially submerged. And it was so dark that I had to use an eight minute exposure to get the shot. So when you go to a new location, how do you prepare? Well, I don't. When I go to a new location, I only do two things. I book a flight and I rent a car, that's it. I don't book hotels. I don't wanna be tied down. I never look at the work of other people from that area. And I never, ever, ever purchase a travel guide to see the must see sites. I don't wanna see them. And why not? Because they have been photographed a billion times by a million other people. I go to Death Valley often, and every time I go to, to Zabriskie Point, I have to laugh at the dozens, sometimes hundreds of people all lined up waiting for the sun to peek over the hill so it illuminates Manly Beacon, and then they all take the same shot. When right behind them is this image that none of them will ever see because it's not in the guidebooks. Ukrainians with eyes shut. My son number two, Cody, was stationed in Ukraine. He was in the Peace Corps. And my wife and I decided to go visit. And as is my practice, I made no preparations. Didn't study a whit about what I would see in Ukraine. I just trusted and hoped I would see something that would inspire me and I would come home with a project. Well, we were into the trip about three days and I haven't seen a thing yet and I'm starting to get a little nervous. Now I'm counting down days remaining. The people are always interesting in a foreign land, but the problem I have with photographing people there is that they always put on a camera face, the big smile. And you don't have time to break down barriers nor a common language. So I was at a bus stop pondering this problem when I saw this old guy leaning against the wall. And I approached him and I tapped my chest and said, America, and he nodded. And then I held up my camera and I said, photographer, he nodded. Then I did that universal sign language for, can I take your picture? He nodded. And so I took his picture. Then I said, using sign language, stop, close your eyes. And he scrunched his face up as if to say, what? And I said it again, close your eyes. 
and I took his picture and it got rid of the camera face. And so I started doing that to all the people that I met. And for the next 10 days, I just walked around stopping people on the streets and by using sign language, asked if I could photograph them with their eyes closed. And I made quite a few friends, several of which I still communicate with this to this day. When I was in Lviv, I was photographing people on the street when this little old man, five foot nothing, came shuffling up and in very broken English asked what I was doing. And I explained. And then he just shuffled away. Well, a few minutes later, later he came shuffling back with a camera in hand and said, can I take your picture? And I said, sure. And he said, with your eyes closed. And he took this picture of me. And I was so grateful that he did it. Why? Because I suddenly was put in other people's position. And I could appreciate how trusting you have to be to let a stranger convince you to close your eyes on the street. They must be thinking, is this a trick? Is it a joke? Are my possessions safe? Will I be pickpocketed? So I was very grateful to the little old guy for asking me and for, to the Ukrainian people for being so trusting. Do you dance? This is a story that I heard told by an emergency room physician. He was working one Saturday on the Navajo Indian Reservation when an old man walked in with long braided gray hair. And the old guy just stood and stared off into the distance, didn't say a word. And the physician came up, grabbed a clipboard, came up to him and said, can I help you? And the old man just continued to stare, not saying a word. And the physician, just a little perturbed, said, look, I can't help you if you won't speak to me. And the old man turned and looked at him and said, do you dance? And this caught the physician off guard. And he wondered if this wasn't maybe a medicine man who believed in healing through song and dance. And so he replied, no, I don't. Can you teach me? And the old man said, I can teach you to dance, but you must hear your music. Thought about this story for two reasons. The first, a few years ago, my wife decided that she and I needed to start going out dancing. And so she signed us up for dance lessons. And how my wife learned to dance and how I learned was completely different. I learned by memorizing the dance steps, I would stare off into the distance and I would count out loud. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And as you can imagine, I was rather stiff and stilted. My wife, however, learned by closing her eyes, listening to the music and flowing with it. We were quite a contrasting pair. And I remember the first night we went out dancing. She whispered into my ear, are you gonna count out loud, loud all night? It also makes me think of we as photographers and how we learn the technology of photography with our mind. We love the gear and the gadgets and the math and the relationships between f-stops and depth of field and shutter speeds. But we must hear the music. Otherwise, all we're doing is taking snapshots, not creating images. Harbinger. My son number four, Jem, and I were out on a father and son outing. It was a very hot summer day in July, and we were in eastern Utah. We were driving along I-70, when off to the north, I saw these great mud hills. They reminded me of a moonscape because there was not a single blade of grass, not a single bush on them. And I said to my son, we're going to stop and photograph. And he immediately began to moan and complain, oh, can I just stay in the truck and watch a movie. And I said, no, it's just way too hot. You need to come with me. So off we went to photograph these hills. And we, we hiked a small distance, climbed up on a tall hill, and began to photograph these two hills in particular. And the entire time I'm photographing, my son is complaining. How much longer can we go now? You said 15 minutes, 15 minutes ago. And finally, I just become frustrated between his complaining and the shot just not quite being there. And so I said, fine, we're going back to the truck. Well, we got back to the truck and I happened to look over my shoulder at those mud hills. And I saw this single white cloud 
just above the top of the hills, and it was moving very quickly from left to right. And I could see that in just a moment, it would be centered right over those hills I had been photographing. So I yelled to him, Jim, we're going back. We ran back up the hill. We got the tripod out. We got the camera set up. And I got off one shot. And I always name my images the first words that come to my mind. And I named the image Harbinger, which means an omen of things to come. And I loved the image and others loved it. And they would ask me if I was going to do a portfolio. And I'd just chuckle. I'd say, what are the chances of finding single clouds over interesting landscapes? But as I became aware, as I looked, I began seeing these single harbinger clouds almost everywhere. And now I've got a portfolio of them. It's my favorite portfolio. Another portfolio that was featured in lens work. Now this field in Western Nebraska taught me a lesson about clouds. I lay in that field for over two hours waiting for that little cloud to center itself over that windmill, but it never would. And it was there I learned there were two types of clouds. There are clouds that move across the sky like that first little guy in my first harbinger. And then there's little guys like this one who stay in the same place and they form and then dissipate, form, and dissipate, but they never move. And I'm kind of glad he didn't move because I like it better off-centered like that. Now, how important is equipment when creating an image? Not nearly as important as we think and not nearly as important as your vision. A story. A famous photographer was invited to dinner by a wealthy New York socialite. She greeted him warmly at the door and said, I love your work. You must have a fabulous camera. He said nothing. At the end of the meal, he thanked her profusely and said, that was delicious. You must have a wonderful stove. Now, we all smile at the thought that a great stove makes a great meal. We all know better. But why do we sometimes, as photographers, act as though a great image is dependent upon great equipment. If only I had this sensor or this camera or this lens or this gadget. If I had to choose between the world's greatest equipment but I couldn't have my vision or that simple Kodak brownie with my vision, I'll take the brownie. I'm confident I can create great images with a simple camera. I was in St. Petersburg, Russia, photographing at the Winter Palace. I was photographing this line of trees, and I spent all afternoon doing that. And when I got home, I was disappointed because none of the images turned out the way I wanted. None were usable. And then I remembered I had taken a single shot with my iPhone, a small sensor, eight megapixel iPhone that I cropped and worked and turned into this image. Equipment is not as important as we think, and it's not as important as our vision. Moy standing. <clears throat> when I was 17, I read all the adventure books by Thor Heyerdahl. Thor Heyerdahl was this incredible adventurer who traveled all over the world. But the one adventure that caught my imagination was his trip to Easter Island, Rapa Nui, and his studying of the great Moy of Easter Island. So a few years ago, my wife and I were creating our bucket list. And I just happened to say out loud, I would love to go to Easter Island, but of course that's impossible. And my wife said, why? Why is that impossible? And so off we went the following year. And while there, I created three portfolios. And this is the first Moy standing. There are over a thousand Moy on Easter Island that only 30 still stand. And they stand on these sacred altars or ahus. And you don't get close to them. You don't stand on them. They're very sacred to the Rapa Nui. And so this is a very small portfolio of those standing Moy. This ahu has the tallest Moy on Easter Island, over 35 feet tall. And to put his size into perspective, that is a horse standing next to him. 
One of the things that I do when I go to a new land is I get to know the dogs. I'm a dog lover, and I believe I can judge a little bit about the people from their animals. For example, when you go to Moscow, you would never, ever pet a stray dog because you'll get bit and you're going to be getting rabies shots. Ask my son. But in Easter Island, all of the dogs are strays. They all run loose. And they hang around Ahus waiting for tourists and they beg for food. And we fell in love with this old guy. We named him Graybeard. And we would go by twice a day to feed and water him. And they're, again, they're just the gentlest animals. And I think that's very reflective of the Rapa Nui people. Cole's Rule of Thirds. I was exhibiting a body of work in Boulder, Colorado, and it was opening night and I was entertaining guests. And this woman came up and stood next to me and looked at one of my images and said, you know, that doesn't follow the rule of thirds. And then she pointed to another image and said, and you know, you should never put your horizon on the center line. And I looked at her astounded, astounded because she couldn't see my images. She could only see rules followed and rules not followed. And so sort of in jest, I created Cole's rule of thirds, which states a great image consists of one third vision, one third the shot, and one third processing. But it's the vision that comes first and drives the shot and drives the processing. For too long, I only focused on the shot and the processing, and I was out of balance. And what I created was technically perfect, but soulless snapshots. One of my favorite quotes in the entire world is by Helen Keller, who said, it's a terrible thing to see and have no vision. The Lone Man. I grew up in Southern California and spent many a weekend down in San Diego at La Jolla Cove scuba diving. And so it was only natural that would be a favorite place for me to also photograph. And I was there photographing one day at the children's pool. It's this stone jetty they've built to protect the children from the waves. And I wanted to do a long exposure to show the motion of the water against the stillness of that jetty. But there were so many people out on the jetty that I couldn't find a 30 second break to do my long exposure. So finally, out of frustration, I just went ahead anyway. And when I looked at the image, I was surprised to find that all of the people on the end of the jetty had disappeared because they were moving, except for that one fellow who stood perfectly still for the entire 30 seconds. And I realized that I had seen this before, this attitude, this posture, the stillness. When people stand on the edge of the world and look out into the vast expanse, they feel very small. And they think about things greater than self. Why am I here? Do I matter? Is there any more than this? And, that, and at that moment, when they are alone with their thoughts, I call this the lone man. And people would ask, how do you get people to stand still for 30 seconds? And I'd tell them, they don't even know I'm photographing them. They just become naturally still and pensive. And then in January of 2020, just as COVID was shutting things down, I added this one from Death Valley. This is one of my favorites from the Faroe Islands. And I was so nervous because that's actually my daughter-in-law. And up there was also my son with their baby on his back. And it's such a dangerous place. And so many people fall to their death every year. Uh, it's just terribly dangerous if you get too close to the edges. A lot of my friends love to engage in these esoteric and deep discussions on such subjects as what is art? And my favorite, what is fine art? And I just wanted to weigh in with my thoughts. Who cares? I only ask myself two questions. Do I like it? And would it look good on my wall? A few years ago, a high school senior called me up and asked me if I would take her senior portrait. And I was about to tell her that I wasn't that type of photographer. But then she said something that caught my interest. She said, I want to do something different, something that no one else has ever done. And so we created Ingrid Surrounded. 
And I happened to show it to a friend of mine who's got an MFA in photography. And he said to me, well, you know, Cole, that actually isn't a fine art image. And I said, Russ, I never claimed that it was, but pray tell, why not? I thought maybe there was a cow rule I was unaware of. And he said, because everyone knows that in a fine art image, the subject never smiles. And I thought, how pompous, how silly. I say, create what you love, no matter what it's called or what other people think. Sometimes other people don't understand or like my work. And that's okay, because I don't create it for them. At least I shouldn't. And now I'm going to embarrass myself by showing you a project that I never pursued for 15 years because I didn't think it was an appropriate fine art project. Power lines. I created my first power line image in San Francisco about 15, 17 years ago, but never pursued it because I didn't think it was an appropriate subject. And I created my next one in Minneapolis about five years ago. And then recently I just realized I love photographing these power lines and I don't care if it's art or not art, I just have fun with it. And the great thing about this project is, is these power lines are everywhere. I don't need to go across the world to find power lines. During the midst of the height of the pandemic, I went to the middle of nowhere, New Mexico, where I was isolated and I created this image. A lot of people have tried to guess what that is. No one ever has. It's not a geyser of any sort. It's actually a long exposure of a power plant just over the hill and it's smoke plume. And I shot hundreds of images trying to get that plume just right, but then the wind would blow it aside. Finally, I got the one that I loved. So how do I pick a subject to create a portfolio on? Well, I don't, it picks me. Let me give an example. I was in a hotel lobby in Akron, Ohio, when I just happened to look up at the ceiling and saw this ceiling lamp. And for whatever reason, at that moment on that day, it fascinated me and I pushed the table aside and I lay on the floor and looked at that lamp from straight below. Then I photographed it. Then I started doing that everywhere that I went. And I always look like the rain man. Something was wrong with me because I would walk into a store and immediately stand under a lamp and just stare at the lamp up above. People thought there was something wrong with me. And I had a great time with it. And I can remember where every one of these lamps were taken. That's my favorite Mexican restaurant in Fort Collins. And I started playing with them, arranging them different ways. And this was also featured in Len's work. Then on my last trip to Moscow, I was in their subway and found these three great Soviet era ceiling lamps to add to the collection. People ask me, why do you create? And I've thought about that. We all think about that. And I thought about that 14 year old boy and why he created, just for the pure joy of creating to please himself. But then I started using photography to get positive feedback from family and friends. Then I tried to start winning contests because I believed that a contest was evidence that the image was good. Then I wanted to build a resume, arguing that who would ever take me seriously if I didn't have an extensive resume. Then I wanted to become famous, the next Ansel Adams, and I went through my money-making phase. And it's taken me 50 years to finally come full circle to once again create for the same reason as that 14-year-old boy, to simply please myself. And sometimes I'm saddened that it took me 50 years to learn such an obvious lesson. I do my best work when I create for myself. Linda Ronstadt said, I mean, it's nice to be acknowledged, nice for your work to be acknowledged, but it's not what you do it for. You do it for the work. And if you're doing it for the prizes, you're in big trouble. Moy at the quarry. This is the second portfolio created at Easter Island. I mentioned there were over a thousand moi on Easter Island and a surprisingly great number of them are still at the quarry 
in an unfinished state. They would carve them out of the mountain and then they would slide them down the hill, plop them into a hole so they could reach their heads and finish them off. And now Thor Heyerdahl thought the great mystery of Easter Island is how they move these giants 15 miles across the island. But I actually think the real mystery is why did the Rapa Nui seemingly in a day drop their tools and walk away, leaving them behind unfinished? And that's a secret we'll never have an answer to. So what photographic rules should you follow? I think this is always a good one for clubs. None, unless you want to create average images that look just like everyone else's who are following the same rules. Do you remember paint by number? We were promised that if we followed the rules, and really they were pretty simple, put the right color in the, the right number and stay within the lines, that we could create a masterpiece. Well, maybe not a masterpiece. You don't create a masterpiece by following the numbers or by following the rules. At best, all you'll produce is a crude imitation of a masterpiece. Ansel Adams said, the so-called rules of composition are, in my opinion, invalid, irrelevant, immaterial. And an ex-Ansel Adams imitator said, there are no need for rules when you have found your vision. The Dunes of Nude. Every January, I go to Death Valley. Why in January? Because the temperatures are really nice, 65 to 70 degrees, and the crowds are all gone. They all come in July and August. And every day I spend the first hours of sunlight and the last hours of sunlight on the dunes. I love it at those times because the sun is very low and the shadows are very long and the contrast is very high. And I just love this look. And I've been going for over 20 years, but always come home with something new that I love. And I'll be going back for the entire month of this upcoming January. And I'm so excited after two years of being stuck at home. Now I'd like to share with you the key to a great image. It is not the equipment that you use or how big your lens is. It's not your settings. It is certainly not your location. It's not the software that you use or the rules that you follow. It's not how long you've been photographing or your title. The key is your vision. Vision is the first and most important step in creating a meaningful image. Sugimoto said, if I have a vision, my work's almost done. The rest is just a technical problem. Lenny, a portrait of breast cancer. Linny was a customer of mine. She had purchased the Angel Gabriel. And about a year later, Linny calls me up and says, I've got breast cancer. I've had a mastectomy and I'd like you to photograph me. And I said, Linny, I am so sorry to hear that. But you know, I really don't do portraiture or that type of work. And she goes, I don't care. I want you to do it. I said, Linny, I don't have the right equipment. I don't have lighting. I don't have any portrait skills. She goes, it'll be fine. I want you to do it. I said, Lenny, let me give you the name of this woman I know who specializes in this type of work. No, I want you to do it. Lenny was insistent that this work be created and shown to others. She said that others would benefit from it. So off I went to Grand Junction to photograph Lenny. I found her to be dignified and beautiful but the subject matter was sensitive and uncomfortable. But I had a vision of how I wanted to portray Lenny. And during the shoot, I had this question that I wanted to ask her, but I was fearful it would ruin the mood of the photo shoot. So finally, as we neared the end, I summoned up enough courage 
to ask Lenny my question. I was just getting ready to put my gear away and I asked Lenny, what is your prognosis? And she said, I'll be dead by Christmas. This was in July. That was 13 years ago. And Lenny is still with us. She got into an experimental treatment program. It worked. And now she's got a renewed sense of life. And I'm so grateful that Lenny would not let me off the hook. Because sometimes uncomfortable things, hard things, turn out to be good things. Don't know if you ever experienced this, but people are always telling me what I should do with my images. Sometimes they're diplomatic a little bit with them. They'll say, if this were my image, here's what I would do. But sometimes they're just a bull in a china shop and they'll say, here's what you need to do to that image. I say, don't follow other people's advice, not about your vision. When I created the angel Gabriel, I was so excited. The first time I had visualized and executed and so I took the image and showed it to my mentor. And the first words out of her mouth were, don't center the subject. I tell you this all the time, Cole, don't center the subject. And I was at a quandary. My vision said one thing and my expert friend said another. And so I went home and I tried cropping it differently. And I hated it. I hate it to this day. She may have created the image this way but it was my vision and my image. And there are no experts when it comes to your vision. Another story. A photographer was exhibiting his work for the very first time. In attendance was a well-known art critic. The art critic approached the photographer and said, would you like to hear my opinion about your work? Sure, said the photographer, let's hear it. It's worthless, said the art critic. I know, said the photographer, but let's hear it anyway. You are the only expert when it comes to your vision. And don't ask others what you should do with your images. When someone asks me what I would do, I say, look, if I told you what I would do and you followed my advice and you kept following my advice, soon your images would start to look like mine. And believe me, I've been there. You don't want that. Confucius say, they who walk in another's footsteps never finds their own path. Moy, sitting for portrait. This is the third portfolio I created on Easter Island. Getting to Easter Island is pretty hard. They call it the most isolated inhabited place on earth. We went from Denver to Toronto down to Santiago, and then out to Easter Island. And on that long leg, very long leg, I fell asleep and had a dream. I dreamt that the Moy were actually living creatures, living beings. And I had taken two large stands and a big roll of backdrop paper and had set up an outdoor studio. Then I went from Moy to Moy, inviting them to come and sit for a portrait. What I didn't appreciate was that the Moy had been so poorly treated by outsiders in the past that they were distrustful and many said no. Some said they were too old. Others said they were too infirm. And some just said they didn't wanna run into other clan members whom they had a dispute with. So after issuing the invitations, I wasn't really certain anyone would show up. Well, the day and hour came and no one did show up. But slowly, some of the younger Moy came and sat for a portrait. And as word got out, more and more of the Moy came and sat for other portraits. I woke from that dream, told my wife about it, pondered it for a few minutes, and then told her, you know what, I'm gonna do it. I'm going to invite the Moy to come sit for a portrait. And I did invite them, and they did come. Now, of course, the Moy didn't come to me, I went to them. I would photograph them under cloud cover. Then I would outline them and drop them onto a digital backdrop that I created. None of this I knew how to do, but I found a way. And the reason I photographed them under cloud cover is then I would dodge up highlights on them, 
to make it look like they sat under studio lighting. And I got to know the Moy very well and really came to appreciate and enjoy them. Vision blockers. I mentioned earlier that the most important truth I learned about vision is that we all have one. But surprisingly, when I talk to people about vision, about 95% of the people say to me, I don't have one. I just don't. Some people may, but I don't. I believe we are all born with this incredible creativity and vision until we start listening to other people. When I was 14, as I look back at those images I created from 14 to 17, I believe I had a vision. But then I started putting on vision blockers. They're like glasses that get darker every time we listen to other people's advice. Whenever I cared about what others thought and modified my work, my vision blockers got darker and darker and darker until it came to a point that I could no longer see my vision. To find my vision again, I had to learn to let go of those vision blockers. And once I did that, I was, my vision was able to emerge again. And I became free to create whatever I wanted and however I wanted. Vision is what's left over when you remove all your fears and insecurities, when you stop complying and conforming, when you ignore what other people are doing and you pursue only that which you love. There's great power in creating just for yourself and not caring what others think about your work. The Faroe Islands. I was watching the TV show Shetland on BBC and all the time the actors were on screen, I was always looking past them at the incredible shoreline of the Shetland Islands. And so I decided off I would go, but I didn't know where it was at. So I got on Google Maps, found it, but became distracted by the Faroe Islands, 17 little islands out in the absolute middle of nowhere. So off I went for a month. And by far, my favorite place on earth is the Faroe Islands. These islands are incredibly rugged, weather changing. If it's bad in one spot, you simply go to another island. And green, if you're a color photographer, greens that would just shock you. Puffins, whales, dolphins, everything. It's just an amazing place. And in some ways, the pharaohs seem incredibly primitive and ancient. You feel like you're in the 1700s. Stone houses with sod roofs, more sheep than people. But then you travel through an undersea tunnel connecting two islands. And what a dichotomy between this modern world under the sea and this ancient one above ground. And every day when I would come out of one of the tunnels, I would be faced with this scene and just fell in love with the symmetry. Must have shot it 50 times. And this is the image I finally chose to keep. So how long do projects take? I used to think they took years and years. And I think that's why I never pursued projects. I'm just, I've got a very short attention span. But the truth is, they just take as long as they take. I showed you my grain silo project that took nine months. My trees from a train that took 12 hours. Now I'd like to show you a project that took less than two hours. The ghost of Auschwitz-Birkenau. When we were in Ukraine, we had a couple of extra days. And so we decided to go next door to Poland. We took the train. We stayed in Krakow at the city, city center. And we were discussing what we should do with our extra time. Now I knew Auschwitz-Birkenau was nearby, but I didn't want to go. I am a kind of a person who will not read a book or watch a movie if it's a sad story, if someone dies. And I certainly didn't want to go to a place known as a death camp. But the family outvoted me, and so off we went. We took a tour bus, and on the way over, I began to think about where I was going. And I thought, if surely there was a sacred place on earth, this had to be one of them. And I decided I wouldn't photograph there. I thought it would be perhaps sacrilegious or at least disrespectful. 
So as we got off the bus, I asked the driver if I could leave my gear on board. And he responded, no, he wouldn't be responsible for it. So we began the tour. You begin by being shown this book. On the left, a beautiful black and white portrait of each person. You could tell this was a skilled photographer and he took pride in his work. And on the right, a description of the person. And in the first five minutes of the tour, my head begins to spin. Why are they taking such care to document a person whom they will either outright kill or work to death? Then they took us into the rooms with the iconic piles, the pile of glasses, the pile of human hair, the pile of bridge work yanked from the mouths of the dead. And that sent me over the top. I am not a claustroph claustrophobic person, but at that moment, I just couldn't breathe. And I signaled to my family to continue the tour that I was going outside. And once outside, I just walked slowly, trying to catch my breath, staring at my feet. And then as I started to breathe easier, I began to think about my feet, where I stood, who else had stood there and was now dead? Who else had walked in my same path on their way to the gallows or the gas chamber? And then I began to wonder metaphorically if the spirits of those people who lived and died at Auschwitz-Birkenau still lingered. And then this thought just came into my head. I needed to photograph their ghosts. And so I began to photograph ghosts. Using the other visitors at the camp and a long exposure, I created these ghosts. And I faced two major challenges. The first, each time I set up my camera on the tripod, people would clear out of the way, not wanting to ruin my shot. They didn't appreciate that I needed them for the shot. They needed to stand in proxy for those who lived and died there. And so I had to very quickly devise a technique. I would stand with my back to the camera. I would talk loudly into my cell phone and I would wait for people to come back into the shot. And there I would use a remote shutter release to get the image. My second challenge was that I had only 45 minutes left at Auschwitz and that an hour left at Birkenau. And so I found myself running from location to location. I had to capture these images because I had them in my head and I knew I would never ever be back there again. This is the only image that I created with a living person. And it meant so much to me that one living person amongst the ghosts, but I never tell people what it means to me. I want them to have their own interpretation. And yet when I've asked others what they think it means, I've heard so many different interpretations, none of which were the same as mine. When I first arrived at Auschwitz, I saw these barracks and I thought, surely this is where the guards lived. It looks like such a nice place, but it was actually where the people were kept. But at Birkenau, it was such an evil place. You could just feel it there. And the gas chamber with the ghost escaping. I couldn't go in there, nor could I ever go back. One of the blessings this project has brought about in my life is that I've been able to exhibit it at a number of Holocaust museums and there meet a number of survivors. I was at the Dallas Holocaust Museum opening night showing this work when I saw a woman in a wheelchair being pushed from image to image. And as she got to each image, she would crane her neck very far forward and closely examine each image. And so I went up and introduced myself. I said, hi, my name is Cole and these are my images. And this woman, Edith Molnar, she raised this bony shaking finger pointed at the images and said, these are my images. Edith Molnar had been interned and had survived Auschwitz-Birkenau. I couldn't imagine what she must be feeling at looking at those images. I was also invited to speak at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And there I addressed and met over a hundred survivors. 
you know, we've all heard the stories. Maybe we've heard audio recordings or video recordings of their story. But it's something different to hold their hand as they tell a story of man's inhumanity to man, of injustice and survival, stories that were truly hard to believe. Final tip for the evening, what's the easiest way to make money from fine art photography? Sell your equipment. I didn't get into fine art photography for the money. And there really isn't a lot of money in, in it for most people. I do it because that is how I express myself. I'm not good at expressing my feelings and emotions with words, but I hope that my images can evoke something. Summary, three-legged dogs are awesome and so is black and white. The real key is your vision. Forget the rules, try to never remember them and don't follow other people's advice, not about your vision. Let go of your vision blockers and listen to your music. Thank you. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, before I go, I would like to give away a print of the angel Gabriel for a couple of reasons. Gabriel, uh, first time I ever exercised vision, it was a great image. Uh, it was a wonderful experience with Gabriel. Uh, you know, prior to that, I really truthfully would never give homeless people money. I always would say, oh, they're just going to spend it on drugs or alcohol. And then I started giving them food. Well, with Gabriel, I learned that there is something more valuable than money or food, and that's giving them your time, your attention, your interest, your respect. And so now I've made it a practice whenever possible, I take a homeless person to lunch. I sit with them. I ask them questions about their life. And I've become much more sympathetic and empathetic towards their plight. So how I give the print away, I find the person who's got the closest birthday to today, whether that be the past or the future, who's got a birthday near today? Okay, I think Ron's the winner then. Ron, Ooh. where'd you go? So Ron, all you need to do is email me with your mailing address and I'll get a print off to you. Wow, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Bravo, Ron. Something I will cherish for sure. I really enjoyed this presentation. It really struck a chord, so really, thank you. Thank you, Ron. Well, thanks all for having me. Appreciate your time. Yes, thank you very much, Cole. Uh -oh. okay. Thank you. We appreciate this presentation more than you know. <laughs> Thanks, awesome. Carl. This was awesome. Thank you. Okay. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Thank you.